Drawing on lessons he learned from English tradition, Prince Charles of Wales has a foundation for the built environment that is teaching people how to solve one of the most urgent issues facing mankind. How to plan and develop human settlements so that the countryside is not destroyed. The prince developed a village called Poundbury that he uses as a model to teach his principles. One of the most significant features is that Poundbury is laid out like London and most European cities that were developed before the advent of the automobile and cheap oil. The homes are spaced very compactly and clustered around the heart of the village so everyone can take care of their needs by foot. You don't have to have a car. In Poundbury, it only takes 10 minutes to walk to the town center, or one might ride a bicycle, or even an electric bicycle. The prince said, it shouldn't take two liters of petrol to drive to buy one liter of milk. In Poundbury, one strategy to make the villages more compact was to have the front doors open straight onto the street. And notice how narrow Poundbury's streets are to save space. One feature making Poundbury even more walkable is that it is a mixed-use settlement where homes and apartments are interspersed with new factories, workshops, offices, stores, schools, and leisure activities rather than everything being isolated in its own zone. For instance, a set of buildings may be commercial on the ground floor with apartment homes on the second floor. There are social benefits to the village style of development where people live and work together and know those that they serve on their jobs and human scale businesses. It creates joy in one's labor, right livelihoods, supportive relationships, and a vibrant sense of community, the highest form of social development. In contrast, sprawl isolates people by design. In the United States, there are zones separating the places where people live from the places where they shop and work. Many in the United States don't even know their neighbors. Moreover, the U.S. style of development carefully cultivates automobile dependency. In England, the idea of building compactly in order to protect the countryside came from a book published in 1902 called Garden Cities of Tomorrow, written by a British urban planner named Ebenezer Howard. Ebenezer Howard believed green belts were needed to control the size of the city, as well as to provide fresh air from the countryside and access to natural beauty. Town and country must be married, he wrote, and out of this union will spring a new hope, a new life, and a new civilization. Ebenezer Howard believed there should be paths for pedestrians and cyclists, a lake, organic gardens, and fruit trees. And like Prince Charles, Ebenezer Howard also believed the village should be self-sufficient with an employment base in the town center. It's amazing the impact of Howard's book. After World War II, the government of England embarked on a huge social experiment by creating 25 garden cities. The book also influenced the passage of the Town and Country Planning Act of 1947 in the UK, one of the most successful systems of land use planning in the world. This great anti-sprawl law, among the toughest in the world, mandates that all municipalities in the UK draft land use plans to create green belts around the cities. In effect, this law nationalized development rights. You do not have an automatic right to build in England. This law also made funds available to local governments to purchase land in areas designated for green belts. The green belts surrounding English cities are between 5 and 20 miles wide. The idea of green belts around cities spread to the Soviet Siberia, to most European cities, and some places in the United States. For instance, the state of Oregon drafted legislation mandating that all 242 cities in the state create growth boundaries and green belts. Other cities that have green belts include Boulder, Colorado, San Jose, California, Lincoln, Nebraska, and Lexington, Kentucky. Notice in this green belt in England that you don't see billboards, 
endless strip malls, car dealers, hotels, fast food restaurants, warehouses, sprawling on and on. The English people are very protective of their green belts and realize that they are the green lungs of the British cities, said Andrew Mathias, an information officer with the Deputy Prime Minister's office. The English like walk into the countryside on a breezy spring day, but the value of green belts far exceeds this pleasure. We must have wide open spaces untrammeled by man to preserve wildlife species, for habitat loss is the number one cause for a mass extinction of species. Even pollinators are in sharp decline. In the United States, one-third of plant species and one-third of animal species are of conservation concern, either presumed extinct, possibly extinct, threatened, endangered, critically imperiled, imperiled or vulnerable, according to the Natural Heritage Network. Another major function of green belts is to preserve water catchment areas. Because we're not doing this, scholars are predicting the USA will be fighting wars over water. And finally, green belts are needed to preserve farmland, a protected place where developers cannot buy out the land and turn it into shopping malls and housing complexes. Will we learn to live in harmony with the earth? before it's too late.